Good evening. Thank you, Shivan. Thank you, team, for leading us in worship, that beautiful act of worship. We are able to glorify God and also get a glimpse of who our God is. So as I will uh, mention today, we begin with a new series from Easter to Pentecost, and today's text will be from Luke chapter 24, verses 1 to 12. Jesus is risen. That's the topic for today. In early days in the first century, Jews or Christians used to greet one another saying, he is risen. And when one says he is risen, the other says he is risen indeed. And that's not just a greeting, but it's an affirmation and confession of faith that our Lord has risen. Our hope is in Jesus because he has risen. Resurrection is fundamental to Christian faith. Without resurrection, Christianity will be just another religion. It will not be the faith, the living faith, that we are called to have. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says, in verse 17, if Christ was not raised, then your faith is futile. If Christ is not raised, then our faith is futile. It is because Jesus is alive, because he has risen from the dead, that we can have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Without Jesus, we cannot have that relationship. That's what Jesus said as well. And Christianity is all about relationship, relationship with God, and based on that relationship with God, our relationship with one another and even within ourselves. So it's all about relationships. It's not another um, moral code or ethical code or a philosophy, but rather a living relationship with the living God. And that's what Christianity is. That's what we are called to have, to come into a living relationship with Jesus and God. But over the ages, from first century onwards, many have rejected that Jesus was risen. They did not believe. They thought it was made up by the disciples. It's a legend. It's not, not, not history. It's not something that happened. But so we are going to first look at the record of events just on this text alone. And what are some of the things that point to us that Jesus was indeed risen? Because if he was not risen, he had not risen, and he is not alive, then we are here for nothing. It is useless. We might as well go and stay somewhere else. And one of the reasons that uh, the people rejected the resurrection is because the witnesses were women. Now, we saw in the first passage, the first witnesses for the resurrection are mentioned as women. Three names are mentioned, but there were many women who went, if you read the other Gospels, there are others also who were at the, at the tomb on Easter Sunday. So people rejected the testimony of women because, as we know, in the first century or even the second century, during Jesus' time, women were very on the low rung of society. They were not considered as credible witnesses, either in the Roman uh, judiciary system or in the Jewish judiciary system. Women's testimonies were not accepted. They, 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 were, they were not regarded as worth, worthy people to be listened to. And that we see even when these women go and tell the disciples that what the angels or the men who were dressed in white told them, the disciples also say this is nonsense. They thought they were just seeing things or hearing things. And they, the disciples themselves, did not believe what the women said. We don't know why, but that's what it happened. But women were regarded as not worthy of being uh, a witness. In fact, there were writings in, uh, uh, in the Jewish, uh, in the early times, 
it's better to burn the commandments rather than hand it over to a woman. That's how they treated women. Celsus, a Greek philosopher who lived in the second century AD, he was very antagonistic towards Christianity. And this is what he said. Christianity can't be true because the written accounts of the resurrection are based on the testimony of women. And we all know women are hysterical. I hope no men think like that today. But that's how it was at that time. But the very fact that the Gospels, not just Luke, all four Gospels record women being the first witnesses of the resurrection in itself is a credible, uh, uh, is a validation of Jesus' resurrection. Imagine if the disciples or the early Christians wanted to make up the story that Jesus had risen from the dead. And they know that the women's witnesses are not credible. It will not be accepted by Jews, by Romans, by those in authority, by the religious leaders. Would they have put women as the witnesses if they were making up a story? No. We will put people who have a standing in society if we are going to make up a story so that people will believe. They could have maybe put the disciples' names or Joseph of Arimathea or Nicodemus or someone else who, who had a standing in society rather than mentioning women. So the very fact that women are mentioned as the first witnesses in all four Gospels shows us that that's what really happened. The women did go to the tomb and the women did see an empty tomb and the angels spoke to them and said that Jesus is risen. So the, the, the argument that critics say that it is not valid in itself validates the resurrection. The second thing that we can see is the disciples were doubtful. Now these are people who had lived with Jesus for three years or so and after that who were taking, taking up the cause of Jesus to say and even sacrificing their lives later on. So if they were part of this story that was made up as critics say wouldn't they like to portray them as heroes of faith? Because they are the ones who are taking that uh, course and going forward. Will they show them as weak, doubtful people who didn't believe Jesus? His words that were mentioned, who never expected Jesus to uh, raise from the rise from the dead? They would have definitely put them as people who were waiting for Jesus and who actually went in expectant of Jesus' resurrection. So that these two things actually show us from this particular text that the story of resurrection did happen. It is not a legend. But there are other evidences as well and hopefully we will go through that uh, in the coming weeks as well. But one more thing that Paul mentions in 1 Corinthian, Corinthians 15 is that Jesus appeared to over 500 people and also to him later on he says and he says some of these people whom Jesus appeared to are still alive. Now why does Paul mention that? He says if you want to validate my story go check with those people. They are still alive. They will say that Jesus appeared to them. And even Luke mentions the names of these women here. And people could have always verified whether these women, from these women, whether this story was true. So there are, in, there are names mentioned and Paul mentions okay, saying that they are still alive and people could have easily verified that, they, that the story is true. So resurrection is true. And throughout history, people will witness and testify to the fact that Jesus is alive. Billy Graham, of course, he says, God, Billy Graham says, I know God is alive because I spoke to him this morning. And that may be the experience of many of us, hopefully ho all of us. We know that Jesus is alive because we have a relationship with him. And the fact that Christianity 
exploded after Jesus' death is in, is in itself is a testi testimony for Jesus' resurrection. Now, during, uh, before and after Jesus' time, there were many messiahs, so-called messiahs who came, claiming to be that they are the messiah of the Jews. And there were many followers and disciples for those messiahs. Now, those leaders died, and the movement died with them. But not with Christianity. Christianity, in fact, grew in a phenomenal Expl explosive manner after the death and resurrection of Jesus. And the reason is because Jesus is alive. And all what Jesus said in the Bible came true. At, at least that resurrection part. And then they started believing and claiming what Jesus said. So the first thing is resurrection is true and therefore our faith is worthwhile. It's not futile. We believe in a living, risen Lord, like Ruanti mentioned. He can hear us, he can see what we do, and he is with us. The second that we think is, so, so what, what does it do to us? It gives us hope. Resurrection is all about hope. The disciples were in fear, thinking that Jesus has been killed. They were defeated, and they were all in fear. And resurrection gives us hope. And the first aspect that I would like to take from here, the part of hope is God is in control. Jesus was not defeated by evil. That's what the Romans and the Jews thought. That evil has triumphed. Finally, we have done away with Jesus, this person who has been causing a lot of trouble for us has been crucified and done away with. And they thought they have won. But evil was defeated in resurrection. It was, a, it was not an easy thing for Jesus to do. It was a humiliating path. It was a painful path and seemingly a defeated path. Even the dis disciples thought that. And Jesus was many a times tempted to move away from the cross. But because he trusted in God's goodness and became obedient to death, God raised him from the dead. That's what the Philippians passage tells us. And being found in Philippians 2, 8 and 9 says, He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Therefore, God highly exalted him and bestowed in him, on him the name that is above every name. So evil has been defeated. Death has been won. And that's what the story of resurrection is. Though evil and powers of darkness seem in control, in fact, God is in control. If you look at the angel's message or announcement to the women, he says, didn't you know that the Son of Man had to be handed over to sinful men, crucified, and be raised. So it is all God's plan. It was not that Jesus succumbed to somebody's violent and evil plan. It was God's plan. And that's why, right throughout even the suffering and the crucifixion and all of that, God was in control. Jesus says, if I want to do, I can call my army of angels. But it was God's plan. And therefore, Jesus submitted to God's plan. So God was never out of control. God was never defeated. He was always in control. Whether it is Good Friday or Easter, throughout, he was in control. And he is in control still. But as I said, it is also because Jesus submitted himself to God's will and plan that God raised him. Imagine if Jesus had wanted to choose his own path, which he was tempted to do many a times. We will not be here today. But because God, Jesus submitted and obeyed God, though it may be difficult, humiliating, and uh, a defeat in the eyes of society, because he submitted, 
we have a risen Savior. So what does that imply? What does it have for us today? Well, we are in times uh, of despair and hopelessness in our country. Many are even thinking of leaving our country. There is no future for the younger generation, they say. I'm sure you may have faced pressure to leave this land and find uh, havens elsewhere. We as parents sometimes are anxious about our children's marriage. When age catches up, we tend to push them to marriage. And sometimes we, we and the young people make decisions that are not pleasing in the sight of God, get into relationships that are not glorifying to God. Similarly, we may also consider job opportunities because of the prospects and the monetary rewards that come along with that. But remember, we become victorious only when we submit to God's will. I'm not saying going abroad is wrong. I'm not saying we must get married. I'm not saying we must choose jobs that are giving us good rewards. But we must first consider whether it is within God's will. It's only when we submit to God's will and choose within God's will that we become victorious. That even though it may be sometimes living in this country because that's what God wants us to do. Maybe waiting till God shows us the right person for our lives, not rushing into marriage because someone is reaching 25 or 30 or 35. Maybe not choosing the job according to monetary value, but whether this is what God wants me to do. It is only when we submit ourselves to God's will and listen to his voice that we become victorious. God will not force himself and control our lives. That is not what I meant by God is in control. We have a free will and God will want us to submit ourselves to his will. It is only when we submit that we become victorious. The second thing that we see from uh, this passage, the hope, is God keeps his, his word. God's words will come to pass. Again, the, the announcement of the angels. Do you not remember what Jesus said while he was with you in Galilee? That he, the son of man, will have to be handed over to evil men, be crucified, and be raised again on the third day. Jesus has already said that. And he will keep to his word. God will keep to his word. It may be a uh, 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 near impossible thing. We may not be able to fathom through our rational minds. It may not, some, may, may not be something that, was, that has happened in the past. We can't imagine how God will do this. But if God has said something, he will keep to his word. Now, during Jesus' time, the Greeks did not believe in resurrection. The Jews, some of them believed, but they did not believe that their uh, idea of resurrection was different, the theologians say. They say they believed in the resurrection at the end when all Jews will be raised, not an individual being raised. And so they were not, they didn't have any idea of Jesus being raised. Maybe that's why they didn't even understand uh, when Jesus said that he will rise in three days, three days time. Yet, God keeps his word. So sometimes we, we may wonder, will this come true in my life? Will this word that God speaks in the Bible really happen? Maybe when, um, oh, sorry, this is a quote that I uh, saw somewhere. I thought I will just read it. The world's promises. We can see the advertising companies and many products are advertised full of emptiness. But God is different. Instead of promises full of emptiness, on Easter, he gave us emptiness. That's the empty tomb that is full of promises. The Easter message is a message of hope, of promise. 
because something that seemed so impossible has come to true therefore all of what god has said in this word will come to true will come to pass we do not have to doubt because the most difficult thing that we may think of a person being raised after being crucified to come, has come alive and therefore all of what god has said will come to true jesus said the heaven and earth may pass but my words will not pass away and therefore his words will not pass away now what are some of the things that jesus has said that uh, that we can take for ourselves today now there are, there are many and you must be cling, you may be clinging on to some words which comforts you which motivates you which challenges you and which actually helps in times of trouble but for want of time i'm just going to mention a few verses here come to me all you who are weary and burdened and i will give you rest this is a promise that jesus says come to me all you who are weary and burdened and i will give you rest so what does that mean we don't have to go after other things substances or other people when we are weary and tired when we are confused when we are burdened with things all we have to do is come to jesus and he will give us rest so that is we don't need other things or others uh, for comfort i am the way the truth and the life no one comes to me to the father but by me so our relationship with father with god is only through jesus not through any other mediums so we don't have to worry whether we are in this sanctuary or whether we are in the home or whether in in a marketplace we can always have relationship with god through jesus christ the sanctuary in itself does not matter because it is jesus who helps us to have a relationship with god now this is another word that but these are words of comfort but there are also words of challenge or calling for us to live in accordance with god's word now he says he will come again and he will be judge of the world and that is something that we need to consider seriously if, if what jesus says will happen then he will come again as the judge of the world and we all of us have to give account of our lives so we are called to live a life that is worthy of his calling as people who have accepted jesus as our lord we are called to live in accordance with his standards his livings and his calling now there is a verse about forgiveness which sometimes maybe many of us all of us struggle at times and this is a verse that jesus said at the sermon on the mount soon after he uh, said uh, he taught the disciples how to pray he says for if if you forgive others their transgressions your heavenly father will also forgive you but if you do not forgive others their trespasses neither will your father forgive your trespasses it's very strong direct words that is there is no going around about it if we forgive others who sin against us who have done something wrong against us god will forgive us i'm sure we all want god to forgive us because we all sin we make mistakes we do wrong things we shoot our mouths and we want god to forgive us but god's forgiveness is conditional that we forgive others who who do wrong to us and there are many stories that jesus said to to illustrate this but do we consider that seriously do we believe that this is god's true word and are we willing to forgive others and receive forgiveness from god so people as be- as people believing in the risen lord we have hope because of his resurrection 
we have hope that God is in control and therefore we don't have to fear or fret because he is in control. Reverend, late Reverend Govindaraj, who was serving in Jaffna in the 90s, once mentioned this in, the, in a sermon and that stuck in my mind. He said, the best thing or the safest thing to do is to be in the center of the will of God. The safest thing, that's the safest place to live is to live in the center of the will of God, whether it be in the war zone or in a comparatively safe haven. The safest place is to be in the center of the will of God. So as people who know that God is in control, we are called to live a life that is pleasing in his sight, that is within his will. We make decisions and choices that will glorify him, that will be witness to others that we are God's people, that we believe in his resurrection, that we believe that nothing can defeat us, no matter what the society says, no matter if they say that we are poor and we have lost out on life and missed out on years, because we chose to live according to God's law. Because God is in control and we will become victorious. Now, each one of us have to discover for ourselves what our calling is and what God wants us to do. Just as the disciples discovered, the disciples did not believe when the resurrection story was that the witnesses were given to them first. But as time goes on, they discover what it really means to be people of the risen Lord. What assurances can they get and how they need to live in the society. And that's what we may look at during the next few weeks. And uh, let us be open and commit ourselves to see that we discover what the Lord tells us during this time how to live as his people, how to be hopeful people in a place where there is hopelessness. How can we live out the risen Lord's victorious life? Let us pray. Let us spend a moment in silence and respond to Lord's message if he has spoken to you in some way, you can respond to him. God our Father, we thank you for the hope that we have. Thank you for what you did, Lord. The cross and the empty tomb, for all that it entails for us. Lord, we can only say thank you. And we want to pray that you will give us a strength to trust in you, to trust that you are in control. And Lord, all of your word will come to pass and that we will hold on to them and live a life that will be pleasing in your sight and victorious at the end. In Jesus' name, amen.